My name is Timo Selis. I'm, uh, I'm uh, an ex uh, Athena person and uh, soon to be uh, current. Uh, as you know, we will be leading a new research unit here in Athena uh, Research Center called Archimedes. And there will be more on that uh, later. Uh, first of all, um, it's, it's a real pleasure for us to host uh, Michael Brody here today. Uh, Michael is a He's a longtime friend of uh, of uh, the not only the database community in Greece but in general. Um, I must say that I remember Michael from uh, I'm sorry, Michael from the eighties. Oh, I go uh, back further. <laughs> my PhD uh, was seventy. But anyway, in your in your uh, in your uh, bio, you say you have fifty years of experience, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I was a student That's... back then, and I was reading Michael's papers. Um, when Michael was at CCA. Oh, right. Computer Corporation of America, something like this, yes? Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, Michael has a very long journey in our field. Uh, I, I do remember that he, he went to Verizon for about 20 years. Yes, too long. Too long. Mm -hmm. uh, but then um, um, what's really exciting is that he has been serving uh, in the area of data science in various positions, including um, at MIT, uh, now at Harvard. Um, he was, or I don't remember if you are still Michael, in the advisory board of a big data science center in Ireland, uh, the Insight Center. Mm -hmm. um, and what I like with Michael is that he's going to give us a talk about his uh, I don't know, 10 plus years experience on data science and how to build um, organizations or research institutions, et cetera, uh, that work on uh, data science. This yeah. is gonna be the topic today. Thank you very much, Michael, for being here. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for uh, physically being present, some of you and uh, many of you over Zoom. Um, we would like to make this talk interactive. It's just because of the overhead, if there is no uh, uh, problem, uh, we will take questions from the people that are here during the talk perhaps. But if you don't mind people from Zoom, uh, we can save the questions uh, for the end of the talk. Um, and just because um, I'm, I'm not very good in, in, in following on Zoom who has raised hands, so please, Let's keep the questions uh, till the end. But in order to make this a little bit more interactive, we may take some questions from people here on the floor. So, Michael, the floor is yours, and thank you again for being with us. Well, thank you, Timos, for that. So, the head of my lab at uh, at Harvard is Stratos Idrios, an incredibly bright Greek, and he's just a wonderful human being. So, anyway, it just gives me more exposure to Greeks uh, currently. So I'm gonna to talk to you about data science. And there's a practical aspect that many of you I'm sure are familiar with, but there's a philosophical aspect of it that will blow your mind. And if it hasn't already, um, data science is one of the most innovative and active new fields in the 21st century. You all know about gene editing, which seems like a big technology, and protein folding or discovering the Higgs boson. All of those are really big things. Data science is much bigger. In 40 years from now, people will look back and find that data science is providing them more knowledge around the world than the previous 100 or 200 years of science. So, the topic I'm going to talk about today is my research, which has to do with defining what the field of data science is. Now, I don't, I'm not arrogant enough to think that I myself can define it. In fact, data science is derived from over 25 disciplines. And so for, to define data science, you need each one of the disciplines to contribute their ideas or their definitions, their formulas, their models, their principles. And then when they are applied to data science, 
you need to then unify them, unify them to be applied in data science. And I'll give you many examples of this. And the unification requires that each of the disciplines that is contributing to whatever the concept is, they have to agree, not just in the terminology, but in what it actually means. So that's the first level at which I'm going to talk about which I'm going to talk today, but there's a much deeper level. And that is how does one reason in data science? And so you're all aware, hello, Yanis. Uh, you're all aware of thousands of applications of data science that have been enormously successful. So obviously humans can think enough about data science in order to use it to solve problems. That's only the surface level. We have no idea what it means to reason in data science. We do know something about the limitations of uh, uh, not uh, the capabilities and limitations of reasoning in data science. And that's the area that I think if you don't already know it, when you walk out of this room, you'll be dizzy. So here's my story in that area. I've been doing data science research for about a decade. And while I was at MIT, I had an insight that data science was fundamentally different in thinking and reasoning than anything any human had ever known. And unfortunately, nobody shared that view with me. So I then proceeded for three years to go deeper into the definitional part and into the reasoning part. I'm trying to understand you can't do data science unless you understand the reasoning. The reasoning to apply it, the funny thing is, in, sci in order to understand data, do you know how people understand how data science models work? Empirically, you watch how the damn thing goes, then you change the width or the depth or some of the hyperparameters or some aspects of the model, and you say, oh, that seemed to work pretty nicely. I'll give you an example that we're doing at Harvard. When you do image recognition using machine learning, you start off with images. Well, what are images? Images are things that you and I see with our eyes. Data science hasn't got eyes. It doesn't know what a cat is. It doesn't know what a pizza is. So what happens, uh, so here's a, a minor example of trying to understand what data science image recognition actually does. So we have a student who's looking at optimization of data storage. So if you give an image, it's typically um, 512 by 512 uh, bit image uh, per rectangle. And, um, but then you say, well, wait a minute, um, I'll bet you that uh, data science doesn't have eyes. So they're not really um, looking the way we look. So that we reduced it to five by five, five by five pixels. It did just as well. So, um, so that's, that, by the way, is a way to optimize storage and computation. But it gives you an insight that you should not think about data science thinking like you think. Oh, you know, you know supervised uh, learning, right? So you say, cat, 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 cat. And after a while, it gets an image of, of let's say you give it a million cats it gets a pretty good recognition of a pattern of a cat. And it calls it a cat. Cat is C-A-T. It knows nothing more than an image. And that is simply a convenience for you who are trying to train the image recognition to recognize cats and peaches and teapots. At least when it sees it, it'll tell you it is one of those, whatever those are. And it happens to have been cat. Boy, I'm only on the first slide. So throughout the talk, I'm going to talk about um, the concrete aspects of my research, which is really why I'm here. Uh, in order for um, uh, Archimedes or any group of data science to uh, data scientists to work together, can you get rid of that? Can, it, it's, it's can you manage to get rid of that right hand, the right hand side thing? 
this one. Uh, you, you can control the screen. It's yours. Uh, which, me? Which picture is on there? How do I? Can, I think. Uh, can I get you, out of you here? You have to go to Zoom. Do you know, Yanis, how to do this? Then, oh, if I close this? Yes, this one, yes. That's the one. Yes. Ah. Okay. Let's try again. It came three hours early just to make sure the technology worked. Uh -huh. I should have sent my data science counterpart. Throughout the talk, I'm going to talk about the concrete aspects that I think that Athena would, uh, that uh, uh, Achilles would, not Achilles, Archimedes, Archimedes, one of those groups. <laughs> All right. So, um, but I'm going to give you some insights, and some of these insights relate to that world-changing aspect. Um, this quote, oh, so I was telling you that I, I was thinking for about three years now deeply about the nature of, of, of data science and what one can do with it, and what it's going to allow humans to see. You're gonna see a different world than humans has ever seen before. This, this statement could not have been made before data science. And this statement here on the screen doesn't come from me. It comes from a really great book that just came out uh, in September. So you can imagine how happy I was that an entire book came out and described in great detail precisely this concept I'm trying to tell you that data science is going to change human reasoning. Um, so for example, so almost all of our human knowledge comes from philosophy who, de who develop notions like concepts and how one, uh, they, they develop an epistemology of some subjects and collectively that contributes to human knowledge. But predominantly the knowledge we all have comes from mathematics and science, where people are trying to be more precise about whatever the phenomenon is we're trying to understand. Every model we have from science is an artifice. It is entirely artificial, why? Because it came from a human. I'll give you an example, a really exciting, a really simple one, but very exciting. Until the 12th century, everybody on planet Earth thought that the universe surround, went around the Earth. It was geocentric. Ask any human during that, from the beginning of time up to the 12th century, and that's what they believed. Copernicus had a telescope. And he looked and he said, well, wait a minute. All those crazy orbits can be simplified if we went around the sun. So starting at around the 12th century, it was heliocentric. Do you know that it wasn't until 1924 when Hubble de in, in created his telescope and he saw the Crab Nebula? Wait a minute, the Crab Nebula is further out than the size of the galaxy. There must be something outside the Milky Way. 2022, today, cosmologists believe, astrophysicists believe, that there are between 100 billion and 200 billion galaxies. There is no such thing as a center of the universe when you have 100 billion galaxies. Now listen, if you use the science up to the 12th century, everything that was proven about being geocentric was true. It was just incomplete. And then heliocentric, all of that was true. All of the experiments that were run about on the assumption it was heliocentric was true. Now we're gone out to 100 billion galaxies and we have no idea what's going on. And you realize, and so, sci oh, what am I doing here? I get off, I'm, you're gonna have to stop me on these stories because they, so the point is everything we know comes from humans and it's artificial, meaning it is inherently complete. Ah, sometimes nature says, hey, wait a minute, look at me. Fleming, in 1923, invented penicillin, not because he had a model of what penicillin was, but because 
overnight, he left something in a Petri dish. He came back the next day and the virus that had been in the Petri dish was dead. That was nature inventing, not inventing, telling us there's such a thing as anti, until 1923, there was no concept of an antibody in medicine. It was because nature, so not much of nature reveals itself. We find out about the universe around us through models and through experimentation. Um, all right, so moving right along. So and now I'm gonna give you my background with respect to advising in data science. In uh, 2012, the Science Foundation Ireland, which was a national research uh, council of um, Ireland, they did something, I have no idea why they did it. They never told me. They fund major research institutes. They have seven universities. There were seven major research institutes. They took four of those institutes. They didn't tell them until it was announced. They took the four institutes, they put them together into one and said, you're going, you're going to do data analytics. Of course, they had no idea what data science was. They, they just saw the value of data. So that was very fortuitous. So they created what was one of the first data science research institutes in the world. They have currently, they have, four, well, they had about 300 then, but now they have 400 researchers, 100 million euros, that from the government, but that has to be balanced with 100 million euros from industry. They have 80 industry partners and now there are eight institutes. So um, the story about data science. So I was an advisor to one of the major institutes that was converged into the Insight. It's the name of the research institute. So they asked me if I would advise them on Insight. I didn't know what data science. I only had a minor idea of what data science was. So after about two years, when I had intensely started looking at data science, I came back for one of my advisory meetings to Ireland. And I got the, at the time there were four institute heads. I got them together to review data science. One of them um, from the University of Cork, uh, he actually was the president of the European AI Society for five years. So he knew data science, he knew machine learning, he knew all that stuff. The other three people had no idea what data science was. They didn't know what a workflow was. So it seemed to me, why? Uh, so I started looking around for a good definition of data science so they could use it. There was no such thing. To this day, there's no such thing as a coherent, comprehensive definition of data science. But my intuition in about 2015 was, why don't we as a group put together the definitions of data science so we can have a common understanding of what it is? And when you make a research contribution, you can add it to this syllabus of what data science is. And they loved it uh, uh, organizationally because they sold it to the government saying, we are going to be greater than the sum of the parts because everything we're going to use is everything we make up is going to be used by other people. That never, never happened. Uh, they got their second year of funding. How did, how did that happen? Where's my mouse? There we go. Where is my mouse? Anyway, they got their second round of funding just as I was leaving um, based on the premise that they were going to pursue the science of data science, which is the term that I was using at the time. They got the funding and they never did the research. So this uh, diagram simply shows you, oh, the reason they didn't do the research is one of the reasons I'm here because a data, a data science research institute needs to be able to collaborate. In order to collaborate, you have to have a common vision of the, um, of what data science is about the definitions, the methods, the models, and all those sorts of things. And that doesn't exist um, anywhere in the world yet. So um, this is just a slide to let you know that data science is widely used. Oh, I haven't, oh, I'm gonna do that now. So how widely used is it? Well, hundreds of thousands of applications are running in industry. 
anybody who's used Google search uh, is a, a customer of data science. So the next number should surprise you. In 2020, 120,000 papers were published in reviewed uh, places, conferences, and journals. That was 3.8% of all refereed papers in the world, meaning that within a few years, data science went from nothing to being the most widely published discipline <coughs> field, I'll clarify that later, field in the entire world. How many journals cover data science? 201. And when I was in um, uh, Insight, in around 2015, I started tracking uh, data science research institutes around the world. In about 2012, 2013, there were about three. The GMD uh, had one. Uh, there was, of course, Insight in Ireland. And one was starting at Berkeley and another was starting at uh, Stanford. So they were just starting. There's now one in every university in the world. So that's your competition. Um, uh, there's so many cool things to say. Um, I'm just, I'm going to tell you kind of a long story now. And the reason I'm telling you a long story, there are many reasons. It is in order to understand data science and its capability, you need to look at it at, at an example in detail. So I'm pretty sure a lot of people think that data science is oh, I want to do image recognition. Oh, I'll go get this model. Or I want to do some NLP. I'll go get this model. I'll just apply it and I'll be done. It's not like that. It is if you're using a standard model for doing an analysis. That's, that's, that's being done regularly all the time in industry in particular. I'm going to tell you about how to create a COVID vaccine. Uh, and so this diagram here is to emphasize how data science accelerates discovery. <clears throat> Here's the premise. Prior to data science, we were using science to investigate phenomena. And you did it using the scientific method. In data science, I'm going to use the same terminology. We are trying to investigate a phenomena and a phenomenon. And we do it by looking at data. And in science, you do it by looking at experiments. So those are the two things I'm going to juxtapose. And I think I have it here where, so in trying to reduce the impact of COVID, you use a clinical trial. When you do a clinical trial, you already have um, a vaccine. It has been proven over a model like mice or rats or whatever. And you get approval to run a clinical trial to ensure that it will be safe and effective. So three premises in a clinical trial, safety, that it won't kill the people, uh, efficacy, the extent to which it'll uh, uh, eliminate uh, the vaccine in, or, or the effects of the vaccine in the person. And the third is, breakthrough cases. A breakthrough case is a case where somebody is vaccinated, but they, all, they also get COVID. And so they tested those three hypotheses. And the third one was any breakthrough case needed to be minimal. It, it couldn't almost kill somebody or couldn't destroy their life. And all of those worked. A clinical trial takes, for COVID, it took 30,000 people and so what is a clinical trial? It is a scientific experiment with those three hypotheses I mentioned, but it depends on what people you get into the trial. So you don't want to do the trial over all people. You don't want the results over all people in the trial. Of course you want that, but that's not what you're after. You want to look at cohorts. You want to divide the population by sex, gender, I mean. Um, you want to divide them by age. You want to divide them by race or pre-existing conditions and a lot of other things. So when they took any one patient into the clinical trial, 
you looked at about 100 parameters, and that didn't change the inherent nature of the study. What it allowed you to do is do cohort studies. And so in all the clinical trials for the COVID vaccine, the number of pregnant women was statistically insignificant. And so they couldn't approve it for women and they had to run the trial again. So I'm telling you the result of a scientific experiment, in this case, a clinical trial, it is definitive. You know exactly what it's gonna do within a margin of error. And um, it takes a long time and a lot of study. Data science, on the other hand, analyzes data. Here's another amazing fact. From March, 2020, for about one year period, there are a lot of people around the world that thought, why don't we use data science to see if we could prognosticate or predict or evaluate how COVID is affecting people. One hundred. Oh, yes, hello. One hundred and thirty-seven thousand. One hundred and thirty-seven thousand papers were written on that topic. Each paper had approximately twenty researchers on them, and they almost all were from medical institutes. Some were from data science. Another interesting thing is it became a prototype for trying to understand how data science is applied to a particular problem. There were 45 papers written on comparing the results. And there was even a meta paper comparing the comparisons. Not a single tool produced by any of those papers was considered uh, clinically sound enough to be applied in practice. So yes, you can do data science faster than science, but the results may not be what you expect. I, I thought that was an amazing story. Anyway, so now I'm gonna tell you another amazing story. This is even more amazing than 137,000 papers by 22 people each. Does anybody know how long it took to produce the Moderna vaccine? Does anybody want to guess? One year. One year. A year. Uh, a year was for the clinical trial. Two days. Two days. Isn't that a, I mean, that's phenomenal. Um, so I'm not going to tell you how it was done. So in 1953, Watson and Crick discovered DNA, the helix. And they understand the, the function of DNA, RNA, and Crick in 1960, um, he defined what is called now called the central dogma of molecular biology. The central dogma of, oh, so yeah, here's the dogma. So the, the question was, how does the body reproduce itself? How do cells reproduce? And the answer is DNA reproduces itself RNA reproduces itself. DNA can use RNA to produce proteins. And uh, a protein uh, uh, is initially a string of uh, amino acids between 100 and 1,000. And then when a protein comes into being, when it's born, so to speak, it then folds itself and becomes, you'll see it in a moment, it becomes. Um, you've heard of protein folding. Protein folding is important because the function of a protein, and there are thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of protein actions that can take place based on not just the protein itself, but uh, the, the folding or the three-dimensional form of the protein, because the form can hold either antibodies and all sorts of other things. I'm not a biologist. I can't explain that. So the DNA transcribe takes the DNA tells RNA, I need this protein in this form to do this function. So it gives a code to RNA. RNA translates up, it's called the uh, messaging RNA because it carries the message of the protein code that the ribosome is going to create. And the ribosome produces that. And it says, fold yourself in a particular way and you get the protein. 
So that's how it's done. That's called protein folding. By the way, protein folding was one of the grand challenges of molecular biology that was solved using AlphaFold in 2019. There's a competition annually for uh, <clears throat> of the, the fastest and most correct production of, of folding, protein folding. And AlphaFold won that in 20, they won it every year up to 2019. But by 2019, it was like 85 to 90% correct. So that's part of this solution. So um, in 1987, a pharmaceutical research lab in La Jolla, California said, hey, wait a minute, why don't we act? Why don't we use the benefit of mRNA to produce drugs? This is now called drug discovery. And so what happens is an mRNA vaccine platform was created by Moderna in 2012. And so what happens is it has to figure out what code to give the RNA so that it will produce the right amino acid chain so that it will fold itself to produce, in this case, the spike, the spike um, uh, protein. The spike protein is that red thing uh, that on the ball. The, the spike protein attaches the vaccine to a cell and kills the cell and starts spreading itself. So what they wanted to do is create a vaccine with a spike protein. So notice this, past vaccines was you take a minuscule amount of the virus, you insert it to somebody, the body reacts and creates antibodies to then give you immunization from the virus. This is an information processing process. You get a code, you get a genetic code implanted into an RNA. The RNA goes through this little process and produces the drug. So drug discovery has been accelerated. And in the case of the Moderna vaccine, it was accelerated to two days. That is Moderna on January the 11th received the genetic code of the COVID, uh, the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And they, they were already prepared. In 2012, they created a platform for SARS. SARS was already over, but what they wanted to do was they said, there'll be another SARS a virus coming out and then MERS came out. And so they took the SARS protein um, platform and they modified it for MERS. And so they were ready in 2019 to simply get the, 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 the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the one we're all facing at the moment, and then modify its platform. It took two days to modify the platform. Honestly, I don't know what you need to do <clears throat> is you need to determine the right code to put in here so that this whole process goes. And the process folding, uh, because, you, because an amino acid chain is between 100 and 1,000 amino acids, and it can fold in many three-dimensional forms, there's a vast amount of <clears throat> opportunity or, or choices to be made. And that is largely where the machine learning was used. Okay, that's uh, to me pretty, pretty exciting. So what is data science? I'm talking about data science at a very high level. Most people practice data science uh, in image processing, natural language processing, some algorithm, something or other. But I'm talking to you about it as a field. That is, what is the entire capacity of data science? And so let's look at the history a little bit. Um, the history of data science goes back to the 19, 1957, when perceptrons were, uh, perceptrons were invented. And then in 1970, uh, we got um, uh, neural networks and then machine learning in the 90s. And then uh, things went on until about, of the beginning of 2000, when the amount of data and the com computational power allowed them to do what is happening today. So it's, it's relatively new. Here's another insight. And why am I giving you these insights? The insights have to do with how one reasons in data science. And so I'm trying to not only motivate you to um, to understand that there needs to be a common understanding of data science, 
but you also need to understand how to reason at it. So I wanna to talk to you about data. And this kind of goes back to my coming from the data world and hearing AI guys for, for decades talking about the models and the analytic methods, they hardly ever talked about the data. If the information you're looking for is not in the data, it doesn't matter how fancy your analytics are going to be, you need to get the data. Getting the right data is close to impossible. The data set you are going to analyze, you want it to be representative. You're looking, you, you want to understand a phenomenon. And you want to do, and you need to do it, need to do it with observational data. Observational data is data that is collected uh, without understanding its provenance, its lineage, or uh, virtually any controls that were used to acquire the data. An excellent example, which will illustrate what I've just said, is Thomas Piketty's uh, Capital in the 21st Century. He and his colleagues in Paris collected economic data from 100 countries over 100 years. You can imagine that over 100 years, the economic data reported by each country would differ radically year to year, not, not over the whole time, but year to year. And the different countries would report completely differently. So that is observational data. It's data about the phenomenon. The phenomenon was the, the economics of countries. And the hypothesis he was looking at was one from, uh, there's a longstanding debate in economics that is, is the income from assets greater than the income from labor? And he proved that indeed it was true. Subsequent analysis proved it was uh, true to a much greater degree than he had established initially. So I'm trying to give you an understanding of, he had this massive amount of data, but he didn't control where it came from or what its structure was or what was in it. So if you're going to study a phenomenon, you want the features that you're interested in to be representative of the phenomenon. Now, here's the trick. An observational data set is necessarily assumed to come from a much larger data set of unknown size. So you've got data and you have no idea at all how representative it is of the phenomena. All you, can, all you can assume is it is more or less representative of the subset from which the data came. So for example, if you're looking at a clock of the date and you look at uh, how the clock keeps time over two years, the actual time that a clock keeps is infinite in both directions. So you're never gonna study that. And that's an extreme example, but everything in the world is pretty much continuous. So when you get a data set, it by definition is a very small data set. So I'm gonna mention something now that I'll use in an illustration later. You want the data set to be, have the highest entropy relative to the features you're interested about the phenomenon. And I will illustrate uh, the difficulty of doing that. So I'm telling you that one of the weakest parts of data science is the data. Ah, another thing. Let's say, well, damn it, I'm gonna control, I'm gonna control the data. I'm gonna only use feature one to feature 44, and I'm gonna throw all the rest away. This goes back to what I said at the beginning of the talk. That is imposing a human model on the data. You can do that, but all you're gonna find out is the correlations amongst the variables <clears throat> that you left in the data. And it could be that many dependent variables you've thrown away and you're gonna miss the inherent information that's in there. So I've told you, time's up, we're over. Um, so I've told you that getting the analytical data set is the weakest part. It's also the strongest part because you're not going to get anything more out of data science than is already in the data. So data is like a really important part. Here comes an example. And this example 
Remember I told you earlier that there, there are 25 disciplines that contribute to data science. They all contribute their theories, their concepts, their models, their methods. And, but when they're applied to data science, they need to be unified and coherent. And if we as data scientists are gonna talk about those ideas as applied to data science, we need a common vocabulary. And so that's what I'm gonna describe here. And this is a, an example of the research that I've been doing. So down at the bottom, you see, uh, we're talking about data sets. Uh, let's look at the selection of a training data set from a larger data set. So the, uh, the data set is applied to a, um, the operation select the training data set is applied to an analytical data set. And yet there are many types of data sets you can get out, but the one we want is a training data set. So the, the select training uh, a, a data set operation, it has to be scalable, assuming it's a very large data set. It needs to do data partitioning as is done in databases. It needs to be random. It needs to be as representative of the phenomenon as possible. And it has to have the maximum entropy relative to the, the phenomena you're looking at. I mean, the, uh, the features of the phenomenon you're interested in. So analytical, uh, analytical uh, data set partition. That is an analytical data set, which is an observational data set that comes from science. Uh, the observational data set is also a data science data set, and it has to have characteristics to ensure that you can apply data science. This may have to do with formats and analytical models and so forth. And the random representative of maximum entropy come from statistics, and statistics are also characteristics of uh, data set, data science data sets, and you get the story. So even something as simple as select the data set partition has contributions from many different disciplines. So as I said, um, you want the data set to have the highest entropy. Entropy has a different definition in every one of those disciplines. They're similar. Some of them have equations and those equations are not all coherent or consistent when you try to put them together. All I'm trying to do here is illustrate to you with one simple example that there are hundreds of these challenges. In the past five years, I have, no, past three years, I have defined, tried to, I'm trying to test out my system and I have, uh, defined over 500 data science concepts going back to their original sources. And the definitions aren't so hard. The unification of them is really hard. So I'm going to, this is an eye chart. You're not intended to read this, but the Alan Turing Institute, which is, the data, which is one of the world's leading data science research institutes, it's in London. In fact, I think it's one of the best. They list on their website that they are expert in 12, disci 12 disciplines and 50 sub-disciplines. My work is based on 25 disciplines and maybe a thousand sub-disciplines. And, and they, they, they claim that theirs is incomplete and they're working. So this slide shows you the level at which I am doing my research and that Archimedes, I believe, will be doing its research. That is at least at the managerial level, you'll need to understand data science as a field. Oh, sorry. I was thinking of this slide, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that was that. So what is data science? The simple part about what data science actually is, it's a bunch of concepts, models, methods, principles, laws, and their relationships. Oh, by the way, where did I get this definition? That's the way you define science. Then there is the reasoning part. And just as science has the scientific method, data science has a data science method as a discovery paradigm. And then there are a bunch of data science principles. Now I'm gonna describe some of the power of data science 
again, back to the reasoning. And uh, in most countries, governments, uh, gray haired men make decisions on economic and social policy, health policy and so forth. How do they do that? Well, they're educated, they have lots of experience and they, they, they appeal to their knowledge and experience in order to write, uh, develop those policies. In the American, Canadian and many other governments, there are now groups that are attempting to apply data science. For example, I have, oh, how thoughtful of you. Indeed, I was getting, <laughs> thank you. So in, in, in the Canadian and US government, oh, oh, I have three friends who are representatives in the US, uh, in US government. And I've asked them, when you enact an economic policy, what you often do is you say, it's going to help uh, pregnant single women, or it's going to increase the education of four-year-olds or it's going to reduce the amount of uh, a particular disease amongst Indians or something like that. There's always a reason for the policy. I asked them, to what extent do you know in advance that it'll have that effect? And in what, to what extent do you determine afterwards that it had that effect or not? Well, <clears throat> they don't know. They're politicians. They have experts. These gray haired guys I told you about earlier, maybe some girls too. And, and the point is they draw on their experience, which is idiosyncratic to them. Data science on the other hand, can look at this data and give much more evidence-based decision-making. Okay. Um, oh, another fascinating application comes from Australia where they're taking archeological results and DNA from bones and all sorts of things from all over the world. And they're actually creating a family tree, trying to determine uh, uh, immigration processes and all sorts of other cultural things. Can you imagine a family tree for the human race? I mean, that's pretty cool. And then the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was an experiment. And if you're interested, I'll go over all the details it's a really interesting example of combining science and data science. I actually worked on the CMS project. There were two uh, projects in CERN for the Higgs boson, Atlas and CMS. And I, I worked on CMS. And uh, so the short story with CMS is, uh, with both of them, is when you bombard a, a, a target with um, uh, protons, uh, you, you um, create mil billions per second of energy incidents. One of the incidents is occurs at 1.25 giga electron hertz, and that is called the Higgs boson. The theory produced, the theory predicted that at 1.25 giga electron volts, you'll, you will get a Higgs boson. The Higgs boson exists for a few nanoseconds, and then it decays into leptons and a bunch of other things. So what you're interested in finding is the pattern of energy incidents that occur at 1.25 giga electro, uh, electron volts and the cascade of subsequent actions. There's about seven of them. So they, when they got the experiment running, they had it running for um, nine months, but it broke down and it wasn't a high enough speed. So they, they renovated it and they, <clears throat> um, ran it again, they had two years of data. So if you get like a million or billion, I have no, no idea what the actual number is, of uh, energy incidents per second, you're gonna get a lot of data. So they had a hardware filter, uh, you, you have to filter in hardware, you can't, software is too slow to do that. The hardware filter took 90% of the data away and it left, the, so here's, here's that business about model in, enforcing your own model on the data. So they threw out of the data any of the energy incidents that they could interpret directly in terms of other, do you know how many elementary particles there are? 61. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So if you know the cascades for all the other guys, you can throw them away and simply start looking for this. So they had two years of this data. And the only way they could find 
the Higgs boson cascades in the data was data science. The humans could never have done it. The, the data was just too vast. And protein folding, um, alpha fold uh, achieved uh, success from one of um, biology's um, grand challenges in 2019. It's better now than it was before. And then the Moderna vaccine, as I told you, the actual vaccine, the platform was ready to go and the vaccine uh, formula was produced in two days of doing machine, almost entirely machine learning. <clears throat> the first thing they needed to do was determine what protein was gonna be the outcome that they needed. And they could have chosen other proteins from the virus, but they chose the spike protein because that was the one that ad adheres uh, the virus to other cells. So that was, that was pretty exciting. Now I'm gonna tell you some really terrible stuff. Um, I had a, one of the most brilliant computer scientists, statisticians in the world is, is uh, Michael Jordan. And in 2018, I had a discussion, I had the pleasure of a discussion with him in which he talked about a planetary scale inference and decision-making system for medicine. And here was his um, reasoning. Data science is gonna be used anywhere in which it produces a real advantage. And so there are many, many areas of medicine in which it could be used. And he assumed that it would be used. And then he could imagine that large, so medicine in America is large in hospital chains. So he could imagine a large hospital chain <clears throat> would have a lot of data science in it, would become very familiar with data science and just assume and use its results. But in actual fact, that poses massive risks, uh, some of which I guess I'll talk about in a moment. Now, here's some of the nasty stuff. Um, you know that AI in the United States is supported predominantly by DARPA and always has been. I have an interesting story about that, if you ask me later. Um, and so obviously the US Army has had access to machine learning in all sorts of things. Dogfight Alpha is a very effective fighter pilot machine learning system. It outperforms human beings. That is in a dogfight situation of, air, uh, of aircraft jets in the air, it will outperform every human pilot. I'll give you a reason. Uh, I'll illustrate it with chess. In chess, we used to have automatic chess playing programs that were taught by humans. And a human would say, always in this condition, always take that move, never take this move. And you know, so there's a bunch of do's and don'ts. And then when they got to uh, Alpha Zero, which uh, beat the world's chess champions, human chess champions, they they trained it by having it play itself, no humans involved. So no human model was imposed. And so this human model of don't ever, don't ever move your pawn like that. They found that Alpha Zero did that all the time. Why? Because it allowed them to win. And humans had always not done that. So in Dogfight Alpha, dog, Dogfight Alpha, the machine learning uh, system would drive the jet in a way that a human never would have done. And so the other, the other uh, Air Force system is called R2 Mu, and it runs uh, aircraft, multiple aircraft and radar systems. And it is very effective. Um, so the knowledge I have, damn it, there's that darn thing again. The knowledge I have about war and machine learning, I'm not a war expert, I have no knowledge, but the book I mentioned earlier, AI uh, in the Age of AI, was written by, um, uh, in part by uh, Henry Kissinger. And so it's Henry Kissinger who has identified these dangerous uses of machine learning in war. But he doesn't recommend that you don't use it. You have to use it. It has to be a deterrent. Let me say a few things about machine learning in war. Nuke, the history 
in military combat has been if one side gets an advantage with some sort of weapon, let's say nuclear weapons, they have it for a short time over the other side that doesn't have it. But the other side almost always gets it really soon. So they're always going up and up and up. Nuclear weapons broke that chain because all of a sudden you had a weapon that could not only destroy the enemy, but destroy the world. AI has broken that chain again. It's more dangerous, according to Kissinger, than nuclear weapons. Uh, here's why. When you have conventional warfare, you have at least two sides. And each side knows virtually everything about the other side. What weapons it has, what strategies it uses, the manpower, the machine power, the air force, the, the naval force, all of that stuff. And you can almost always predict what's going to happen. So what happens on both sides is you strategize and you have a whole bunch of strategies ready to go. So if they make a particular move, you have a counter move instantaneously ready to go. Let's say we're using machine learning, both sides. When you're using machine learning on this side, you have no idea what it's gonna come out with. And therefore the other side has no idea what you're gonna come out with or what it's gonna come out with. And in those situations, it leads to escalation. And we know by looking at Ukraine at the moment that even agreements at the United Nations level and amongst combatants that they don't follow the rules. So if you're concerned about your enemy's nuclear weapons, you know where they are, you know how many they have, and you can detect the moment they set them off. AI can run on my watch or on my Mac, and I can give it to you over the web in a few seconds. There is no way to detect how much machine learning <clears throat> in the military these people are using. So we have to have, we have a, I have a principle for machine learning and that is first do no harm. How do you know that you're not gonna do harm? Well, you validate your algorithm. You make sure it produces the right result. No, no, can't do that in AI. I'm, I'm sorry, machine learning. There are no methods of proving <clears throat> that a machine learning algorithm is correct or robust. So that is a fundamental research challenge to the world as a whole, and it's a great area. So I, I showed you earlier that entropy would have a different definition in many disciplines that contribute to directly to data science, and it applies specifically to um, uh, data science, many data science concepts. <clears throat> I'm now going to show you, I, I know it's a lot of words, fundamental concepts in data science are imprecisely defined and many terms are used. So in my lab at Harvard, um, uh, taking the analytical method, people inter intersperse, without defining it, model, algorithm, method, uh, interpretation. They, 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 they use all these terms and we pretty much understand what the other person is saying, but in the general world, we don't. So these things have to be made more precise and we need to come out with standard definitions. Theory, on the other hand, is much harder. So you need an epistemology. An epistemology is an explanation of the knowledge that is capable to be represented and reasoned about within the, within the field. I keep making that mistake. Um, we need to understand of a particular, oh, so th these concepts apply to a specific model or the entire field. We need to know the power of uh, the algorithm or the method. We need to know the scope of applicability, its uh, the scale and complexity and so forth. These are all completely open issues. So here's my answer to solving these problems. It's not solving them, 
It's creating a pathway to solve them. And again, I'm gonna give you some text because I'm gonna to refer to some very famous and well-established people. David, David Donahoe is one of the world's leading statisticians at Stanford. <clears throat> In 2015, he wrote a fascinating article saying, we need a framework within which to define data science. And he gave an outline, but he didn't do anything further with it. <clears throat> In 2020, uh, Victoria Stodden from uh, the University of Illinois said the same thing. <clears throat> and she said that her framework should be based on, on, on the um, workflow of data science. And there are 12 other authors, quite senior people, all of whom have said, gosh, we're gonna have to define data. We, we, we don't have a, an agreement as to what data science is. None of those people really refer to the reasoning part, which is really the hard problem. So in my data science reference framework, <clears throat> there are several components. I've already mentioned the artifacts aspect of that like science, they had concepts, models, methods, all of these things are human descriptions of this thing that we don't understand. The central part of my framework is the a generic workflow of data science, because the only time we're interested in the definition of something is when we're applying it in an, an analysis. And then reasoning is a big part too. By, uh, there's two levels of reasoning that I mentioned earlier. This are the kinds of human reasoning <clears throat> that we need to apply to uh, in order to apply data science. The other kind of reasoning is uh, uh, obscure. We don't uh, we we don't know uh, what it uh, how it works. So if let's say I wave my magic wand and we get a coherent, consistent definition of data science, it should form an encyclopedia of data science. It should be shared by the data science community as a whole as opposed to the way it used to go was the database people did their stuff, the AI people did their stuff, they didn't talk to them. And then Andrew NG came along and said, wait a minute. So he's one of the world's experts in analytical models. He, about two years ago, I think it's kind of a marketing thing for his new company, but as of two years ago, he said, don't go and improve your model, improve the data. So he has something he calls data-centric uh, AI. It needs to be authoritative. What does that mean? Um, I'm going to propose that my framework be an online journal and that you need to be an expert in the field to contribute and you're going to be reviewed by experts. So it needs to be authoritative reviewed by others. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to try, but I'm not going to be the major contributor. It needs to be comprehensive, multidisciplinary, standardized. Aha, another... Henry Kissinger comment. He ends his book discussing what should the world do with something that is going to be so dangerous in war. And the answer is national and international agreements. So for Yanis and I to have an agreement about what data science should or shouldn't do, he and I have to have a common understanding of what it can do and what the terms are. And when we come to an agreement that we should or should not do this, it needs to be formalized in terms of what data science actually is. So having a framework and a definition like this is more than just interest and in research. Unification, I've showed you the nature of the problem. There are thousands of these unifications because many concepts apply to data science concepts. It needs to evolve. We hardly understand what data science is. A decade from now, we'll know a lot better. And it needs to be epistemological. We need to have a theory to determine when something is correct or incorrect or what its bounds are. And practical utility. Um, we're about to implement a model of what I'm doing uh, at Harvard. And there are about 20 actions one can do in, to do research in data science. You, if this were together, what they're gonna do. All right. Um, in the history of mankind, there have been three discovery paradigms. A discovery paradigm is a method 
of understanding a phenomenon, just tools to do that. And the L, by the way, this observation was made by Jim Gray before he passed in 20, 2007. Uh, so empiricism, if you look at Wikipedia, it says empiricism was invented at 350 BC and attributes it to Greeks. Not true. Empiricism has been around since about 9,000 BC. That's what farmers did. They would plant a field and they'd say, well, I wonder if I put a fish head in with the corn, would it grow better? So inherent in human thinking is empiricism. You experiment with things. And then in the 12th century, Roger Bacon was a monk who thought he would write down the details of how he was growing his, whatever he was growing. And he found that his method, if he applied it, would be much more effective. Later in the, in the 17th century, uh, Roger Bacon, no relation to Francis Bacon. Oh, other way around. Francis Bacon was in the 12th century and, and uh, Roger Bacon was in the 12th and Francis was in the 17th. Francis Bacon and David Hume defined the data, the scientific method, a, formula, a, a formulaic way of going through to determine, uh, to run an experiment. And then the standard model of particle physics has 61 um, basic elements in it, and it has many, many behaviors, and it's way too complex for anybody to have in their mind, although most particle physicists know a full amount of it. So you put it in a computer and you can use that computer model to do simulations. Then came data science. It's been around uh, in principle for tw only 20 years. And can I move my mouse without school? My mouse disappeared. No, oh, you can see it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Now I don't think you want to have a pointer. No, I'm, I'm trying to get over to my notes. So um, what I am doing is I am considering data science as the fourth discovery part. I'm taking Jim Gray's uh, advice. And so I'm building data science as one would build science. So I'm making those, those comparisons. Ah, here's a grand uh, observation. The knowledge from data science will exceed the knowledge from science. So pretty much everything we know has come from science. That's a lot of knowledge. And I'm claiming that data science will expand that. Why? Humans, as I said earlier, humans create models of something rather to understand it. So you and I can discuss it. We develop terms and concepts and we, and we develop, but it's a human artifice. We have no idea about what reality really is. Data science creates its own reality. It looks at correlations between variable values. And whatever those values are, it has no, there's no semantics. It is not sentient. It does not think. It doesn't know what it knows. It doesn't know what it doesn't know. So um, I suspect that data science can be applied to anything for which you have data characterizing the phenomenon, which is vastly greater than science, because in science, you need to touch the physical thing you're going to experiment with. There's modifications there, because now um, experiments are being applied to sociology and economics, but in very specific ways. So for example, in economics, there's a Nobel Prize in 2017 for experiments in economics. And that had to do with the fact that in Africa, there was a government that applied an economic policy to one part of the country and not the other. And so that's where the, PA, that's where the uh, research that got the Nobel Prize was. They studied the two and the hypothesis was this policy will change these things and they could determine it uh, on what's called the natural experiment. So comparing science and data science, the basis of data of science is math and science. The basis of data science is, I don't know, I suspect you don't know. Um, the phenomenon you're exploring are, uh, must be testable in science. And in data science, all you need is data. Um, in data science, there is a data science workflow that corresponds to the scientific workflow. And so 
we are now going to have data science disciplines. For example, drug discovery. I already told you about the, uh, R -M the mRNA platform that Moderna has. So, oh, actually I attended a lecture uh, of, of, over Zoom at CMU uh, about a week ago, two weeks ago. And there is now an entire new discipline of acquiring medical data sets from real world data. So if you have a critical uh, case like a coronavirus, you need to be able to anticipate. So data, what does data science give you? It gives you insights. The insight may be right, may be wrong, but it gives you insights. And if you can get adequate data for whatever the characteristic, that you're, the med medical condition you're looking for, you may be able to gain insights. You could then verify in, in more precise ways. So there's an entire new area of medicine having to do with collecting data that could then be applied in multiple areas. Okay, so in the scientific method. Do we have questions now? Yeah, we can ask. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Um, it's only five minutes. Yeah. Why don't you wrap up and then okay. I'll ask my yeah. question. Well, I wasn't. But I want to go back to that. Stuff. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to skip this and I'm going to go to the one of the most important slides of the talk, which is this one. Those are the characteristics of scientific results. And those are the characteristics of data science results. I could go through and explain each one, but they're radically different. Data science does not recognize human concepts. It has no idea what right or wrong is, but science does because science are based on human hypotheses and models and concepts. So given this definition, uh, oh, it's all emergent means you get ideas or concepts that just come out of the data. You have no idea where they came from. Nobody knows what data science is gonna come up with. And dynamic, uh, so one of the major characteristics between an algorithm and a method in AI is an algorithm always produces the same result. And in AI or machine learning, it learns dynamically from changing conditions. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you to think about if data science has the characteristics I showed you earlier, probabilistic, maybe incorrect, certainly imprecise, and definitely representative of the data set you looked at, but maybe not larger, all of those characteristics, how do you think you can manage weapons in war? Pretty serious. Um, let me move. So in my research, I now have about eight documents, Woo, a lot, several hundred pages in each. And so I, 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 the introduction involves the, the topics I'm discussing here. And then uh, volume two gives a definition. I give about 500 um, definitions. I've worked on 500 definitions to ensure that the ideas are uh, working well. And then there's the science of data science, which is, I'm trying to take those ideas and define them in terms of first principles. And then there's the engineering of data science, which is when you take one of these concepts and you want to implement it in a system, what are the principles and so forth. Um, I want to run it as a journal. I'm talking to a couple of journals at the moment. And this, I view the creation of the data science reference framework to be about a decade's work. But let me, Ah, tools for structuring, and maybe I'll stop here. Um, so I've, you've already seen this diagram. Um, all of the definitions, the 500 that I've created, they're in a lexical graph, a definitional graph like this one. And so you can imagine all, all the relationships amongst the concepts from different fields. Then the more important graph is the workflow. And it's more important because you want to know what the meaning of a concept or a method or a principle is when you're applying it in an analysis. And so each one of the definitions maps to concepts within the workflow. 
And so it is a so you, these tools can be used to both develop the framework, develop the definition. So let's say I'm going to change uh, select uh, training data set. Maybe I'm going to change the definition. If I go to change that, I know exactly all the impacts it will have by following these are. It doesn't help me change the definition. It helps me change it by understanding the context within which it participates. So let me let me stop here. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for this talk. Uh, I must confess, I had uh, read a few documents you had sent me in the past, but this is an excellent presentation uh, to make this much clearer. Yeah. And uh, we're now ready to get some questions. Um, I can see uh, people that raise hands, but I think Yanis had a question uh, you are need this, and then Jens Vasily. I mean, we'll get some questions from the floor to, to keep the, the discussion up, and then we will move uh, to, to remote questions. Okay. What slide was it? Um, it, it was done after, done, done before that. Before that. Yeah. Um, and, and then done that before that. But let, let's, let's what, what, uh, leave it there. Uh, thanks. Uh, um, uh, how did I put it? Uh, this talk gives you lots of food for thought. Okay, but he will say it gives me a lot of food. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. And and uh, it's um, yeah. I mean, every slide, you know, it can, it can lead to good research. But uh, which I'll, is the intent? I'll I'll, I'll be um, uh, I'll, I'll go to an extreme. Okay, so. Uh, uh, there is a grain of salt that what I'll say is, is uh, 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 should be taken with, and I'll be iconoclastic. And I'll say that this comparison of differences, I don't believe in it. I believe science and data science is exactly the same thing. And only, um, uh, and the only thing that changes is who does the inference. And if you go to the slide that we just repeated at the end with, with the, the, the terminologies of the data, said, no, 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 the, the graphs, the graphs. I mean, the last slide that you showed. I mean, this one here? The one before. Oh, this okay. one. Yes. You talk, you say observational data and data science data sets. Data science has observational data that then you put into, instead of your brain, to an artificial brain. Okay, and the process is the same. Experimentation happens with data science. You have no idea what you come up with. Fleming was the same. Copernicus was the same. Uh, uh, Yanis and Eriks and Yanis Vasiliou and all the other Yanis and all Yanis have been doing the, 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 the same thing. Repeating, changing the work, not changing the data and so on and so forth. And even in the characteristics that you mentioned, science is correct. Not always. You said science is incomplete at the end, so correct and incomplete. Yes, absolutely. It's absolutely. absolutely the case. And the same thing is for data science. Um, it can be complete. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, correct, and it can be incomplete. So all of your characteristics, again, I say I'm putting it at the extreme, but uh, the other extreme that says very different things, I don't believe in. And, and uh, uh, putting in the two extremes would generate lots of great work. That's why I like the presentation. But um, I, I think the things are much more similar and only two, three fundamental primitives in the theory of, of, uh, of, of what science is, is are the key differences and the rest are the same. That, that, that was really, I hope everybody heard that because that's what I've encountered all around the world. And that kind of thinking is going to fail in applying data science. It's absolutely going to fail. If you don't understand the, the, uh, the finer points of data, that's why I was trying to address the conceptual stuff because 
data science deals outside of anything like human conception. And if you're not gonna get the value of this, if you think it's science, it is not science. It is characteristically not science. And uh, for example, scientists have looked at data. What is the data? Data that scientists look at is the result of an experiment. An experiment is a controlled study that produces specific data. That is not what data science looks at. Thomas Piketty did not look at scientific results of the economy. He looked at more or less random data on patterns about how the economy flows or how movements in the economy. So I, I, I'm, I'm delighted to have such an expert person give that um, a view. And let me give you another reason why I think that kind of thinking is prevalent. Number one, we don't know what data science is, so people have to speculate. And that's an, that's, that was an, a speculation. You've heard me and mine speculation. Do I know better than Yanis? Who knows? We, we have no basis for it. My nephew works in one of Canada's largest banks and he creates, um, he's in charge of their risk portfolio. Risk means you take exceptional risks on certain assets to gain more advantage. And I put to him the following idea. I'll bet you that most people cannot think clearly in terms of uncertainty because number one, it's complex. And number two, it adds a level of emotional distress. And if you look at any of the mathematics concerning uncertainty, it's incredibly complex. I've tried to understand it and I have to say I, I've given up, but you have to have counterfactuals. So you know some things that may have happened and you may have 10 or 20 counterfactuals. You say, well, if this had happened and that had happened and that had happened, but this didn't happen, then that would have caused that. So I believe that Yanis is giving a wonderful example of the difficulty of understanding data science and why data science has not yet been defined. Even after, if it started back in the 60s, we've had a lot of time, but it's been around pretty solidly for 20 years, but we don't have a common definition. And I think it's very difficult. As I say, the data science research institutes that I have visited, even the one at Harvard, they don't have common definitions of what it is because people are not understanding what data science is. The other Yeah, I guess, uh, first of all, very impressive uh, presentation, many, many good thinking. Uh, uh, let me just, uh, it's not, it's a lighter question. Uh, you mentioned that there are 25 disciplines that contribute. Um, is there any attempt, or have you ever thought about it, of some kind of ranking between them and the contribution value? Uh, because, yeah. uh, you know, or at least in, in a gross way. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody is trying to get into the field. What is, what is the minimum amount this, uh, this Yeah, this is a. Is, maybe is a, I'm sorry before you answer, Michael, if you can just summarize the question. Yeah. Some people may have not heard it. So, Yanis is making a really interesting observation. I claim that there is at least 25 disciplines that are contributing to. Um, data science. For example, computational complexity. Most of you probably haven't thought about computational complexity in data science, but now, but now, now, that, um, now that we're getting down into understanding the aspects of uh, how some models work, we are now allowed to look at much larger data sets than we've ever looked at before. 10 to the 11th. 10 to the 11th is the size of the data sets that are now being used in NLP. And in order to reduce the cost and all that sort of stuff, computational complexity is now being used. And one wouldn't, may not have thought of that. So anyway, Yanis asked the question, um, 
what is the ranking of the various uh, subjects? So I'm going to tell you a few stories. Bin Yu is a very well-known uh, statistician from, uh, from Berkeley. She became the president of the International Statistical Association or something in about 2017 or 2018. Her speech accepting, or maybe it was to run for the office, uh, was statisticians ought to own data science. St data science is all about statistics. I love that. So I, 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 re I, I remember that. And I reminded her of that uh, a couple, about a month ago. I said, oh no, that was all politics. <laughs> so statistics and complex statistics are at the heart of what it does. It looks at correlations and, what, and the concepts from statistics understand that stuff. So obviously AI is a big component because that's where some of the first stuff uh, all came from. When I showed you the slides of trying to emphasize the importance of data sets, number one, <clears throat> the difficulty of getting a data set that's appropriate. And if you're gonna clean it, whatever you do, don't throw away real information only throw away or correct data that you know is actually wrong. How do you then prepare it? Oh, change the format. AI doesn't give a damn if it's a visual picture or digits or something else. It doesn't care about that, but don't throw away the information. So data, data contributes. So I'm sure everybody here has seen those Venn diagrams of AI and databases and statistics. Well, that talk about crude, that's really crude. With my system, what you can actually do is trace any concept back to its source disciplines. And so far, <clears throat> um, AI is winning, and that could be simply by my selection of the, I, I've only defined 500 concepts, and presumably in data science, there are thousands. But um, I would say that statistics and AI uh, dominate, uh, data, data systems is more or less in the engineering area. D databases don't know shit about data. They only know about engineering. I mean, you know, data models and all that stuff, all, all that, that stuff doesn't apply. So did I answer your question? Yeah. The fact that the reasoning is extremely interesting. Databases don't know what reasoning is. AI does, of course. Yes, I, I saw you nod several times when I was saying something. So I assume you you were either enjoying or, or hating what I was saying. Uh, we will get, uh, sorry. Um, I think Panos was next. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, remove your mask because we cannot hear you. Yeah. Okay. I'm not a computer, but I don't want to talk about why I was not in the time. But I want to continue on what the president said about what is the definition of data science. So we all have to hear the issues about, uh, for example, what the uh, biology of the science is, math, physics. And we say, for example, that physics try to understand the physical world. Biology needs to understand how organisms work. So is data science Thoughtful question. I, re I really like the question a lot. And we need to repeat the. Uh, uh, so the question is: Is data science actually a science, or what does it actually do? Like science is used to examine phenomena, but when you add science to data science, is is that an is this analogy I had up here reasonable? And the answer is no. So the answer is throw science out of data science, call it X, that's probably more sensible. 
because you, you get forced into a comparison with science, which obviously causes problems. So what is data, the purpose of data science is to analyze, a, uh -huh. you have a phenomenon and from that phenomenon, there is an observational data set, which is relatively small compared to the data that would describe the comprehensive phenomena. You're going to analyze that data set for patterns, correlations amongst variable values. And each one of the patterns found could has a relative, um, let's say statistical occurrence within the data set. One deduces that that means something. Data science doesn't know about meaning, uh, but we humans look at that and think it has meaning. So when you have language or when you have images or when you have something concrete, you can do the interpretation. So interpretation in data science is if you have a concrete model like pictures, then you, you, can, you can help, data science can help you get intuition as to what that is. If you're outside of a model of what a human, of, of whatever the phenomenon is, you're gonna be, have difficulty. So I'm not sure that data science is a science. I don't, I, I by the way, I have a PhD in science, not only database, but I have a PhD. As I told you, I worked at CERN uh, as well. So um, science is discovering phenomena. We all, I guess we're all so familiar with it, it's hard to define what it is, but data science is something completely different. It's analogous in that you are trying to un discover, it's a discovery paradigm to discover patterns about the phenomenon based on data from the phenomenon. But whether that data is representative of the phenomenon, you have no idea. I, 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 did that answer your question? It's uh, on, yeah, on, because I Yeah, I, science is a heavily loaded word, and it's a it's a shame that it was given to data science. Uh, Pano? Well, um, Mike, thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting and I would say provocative talk. Um, could you please go to that slide with the fundamental differences, which is uh, the one that I like? Oh, the one that I like is this one. Yeah. By the way, I I use this. I have this on my wall at my office because I forget. Like like Yanis, I it, I at least I think like Yanis that that I sometimes forget what I'm doing, and I constantly go back to this and say, wait a minute. So, uh, I mean, it's inevitable to go back again and again to this basic question of whether it is a whether data science is a science or not, and exactly what it is. So, I think if there are such uh, fundamental differences between the two, and if we don't perhaps care so much, or data science doesn't care so much about the provenance or lineage of data, then my question is what are the grounds for trusting data science? Oh. As a society, oh. We're using the oh. Science and you hit the nail on the head. So the book, a I'm sorry, <clears throat> Margot. Again, I have to intervene. The question is about how can we trust data science if it is science? Given the characteristics on the slide <clears throat> that indicate that data science results are uh, possibly incorrect. They're certainly probabilistic, and there's also other issues. <clears throat> How can one trust the results that come out of science? And the answer is you can't. 
You absolutely can. So you develop mechanisms. And in my research, I've identified, oh, there's a group at uh, York University in England. There's another group at Oxford. And they're, they are developing from software engineering. They're taking proofs of software engineering techniques and trying to apply it to machine learning. And of course you can't do it. You can't prove that an algorithm is correct or verifiable or whatever it is. They're trying to find analogs to that. So there's a tremendous amount of work that I think Archimedes could probably contribute to, to ensure that any result is, first of all, you gotta be able to interpret it before you can prove it, right? So these areas of interpretability and explainability, uh, those are really difficult issues. So the, the problem comes up, if I'm watching Netflix and Netflix says, hey, I think you'll like this movie, that's AI. They're using a recommender algorithm. Uh, and if I don't like it, I waste 20 minutes of my time and swear at Netflix. If I'm having an operation, it's a different matter. So the issue has to do with, by the way, that's, oh, I, I didn't say that. That was why I was mentioning war and coronavirus as examples. Those cases are critical. If you make a mistake, people will die. And uh, so you take that answer in those critical situations and come back to whatever problem you're doing. The same thing holds. You may be wrong. What are the consequences of being wrong? Can you trust data science? No. You need mechanisms to develop raising your confidence that whatever it comes out with. So here's, don't take the answer from a data science analysis as an answer. Take it as an, an insight. Like an expert has said, hey, why don't you look at this? And so what happens, and I actually had some work in this area where uh, this goes back to my time at MIT, where uh, science was used in medicine to identify either treatments or uh, 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 types of disease that might arise from early signs. So what you do is you get insights and then you go into standard medicine. And only when you're in standard medicine, do you make decisions. Allow me for a moment to take a couple of remote questions. Uh, and then probably we can, we can stop the formal part of uh, the meeting and then move to a discussion here locally. Uh, Panos Vasiliadis, uh, you're first. So, Michael, thank you very much for a, a very nice and inspiring talk. And apparently the, the question of the day has to do with uh, whether uh, science and data science are the same, different, and so on. Um, personally, I find myself uh, very close to what Yanis Ioannidis said. Um, I would uh, very much... Uh, have the audacity to say that I disagree with all the adjectives that you give to science uh, as robust, uh, sound, and so universal, and so on. This is a very clean Popperian view of, of science. Um, everyone after Karl Popper, like, I don't know, Thomas Kuhn, uh, Imre Lakatos, all the philosophers of science have very much you need to dis listen. disagreed with this. And I, I want to focus on two problems. Um, one is the problem of induction, which uh, um, has been traditionally easy for the natural sciences, right? You have the principle of universality with whatever, whatever I observe here holds everywhere in the universe, which simply doesn't hold for medical sciences or social sciences. And the same applies to data science too, as you very correctly said, you cannot generalize easily. We always have the problem of how do I generalize the findings that I have from my data set? How representative it is. The second uh, question I want to, the second issue I want to raise, and I think this may be a little bit more interesting. I, I take the opportunity from the alpha zero example that you put, who trained itself. Now, a, an issue in science is how to generate a hypothesis. Typically, this is an anarchical random thing, okay? Um, there is no formal process. Uh, um, if there is anything that the philosophers of science agree is that nobody has even given a, a strict process of how to generate hypotheses. 
do you believe that uh, it is possible to devise uh, automated ways in which we can generate hypo research hypotheses with principle or with an automated way that then we can try to, to verify? So that's all <laughs> from, from, from my part. Uh, well, let's see if I, I, I can, uh, I have an answer in the top of my head and I don't know if it's right because we did this at MIT in medicine. And what we did is we had a cycle of analysis. That is you set the model and you do an analysis and it comes up with, a, with an answer, so to speak. We don't treat that as an answer we then treat it as a hypothesis. And we feed that hypothesis back in and see is there data to, to support the hypothesis. And we would do this in a constant cycle. So it was a constant issue of hypothesis generation, evaluation, generation, evaluation, generation, evaluation. And they actually use this in cancer uh, research. It was actually in the Cancer Research Institute they did that. Did, does that uh, correspond to what you're asking? I, I suppose that uh, it's a first step. I was thinking that maybe in 30, 40, 50 years from now, you could have some kind of principled automated Oh, 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 I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, you see, I think the issue is that the world is only beginning to under. I said in my talk that I believe that the data science reference framework will take at least a decade to develop. And in that period, we'll be able to understand more and more about what it does and how we use it. And uh, if, if I might say, I'm not sure if you said the same thing, humans are extremely limited in their thinking power relative to data science, because we are bound with all the history of everything we've learned and to learn something outside it, like uncertainty, is really hard for us. You'll find that you tend to eat the same food all the time because changing your habits are very difficult. So I think that data science, let we, what do we call it? Data and analytics or something. But uh, data science could be used to generate all sorts of hypotheses. Why? Because data science models its own reality. That is to say, it finds correlations amongst variables in the data set you give it. And those correlations are essentially hypotheses. So I suspect we can develop tools to propose hypotheses that could help us in science. There. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Pano. Uh, Christo? Hi, um, my name is Christos Emanuelidis. I belong to the Athena community for approximately 15 years, a bit remotely now, as I'm a faculty member at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. A very inspiring talk, very grateful for this, and it triggers us to recall some great philosophy of science debates, as Panos mentioned, arising from works of Popper, Kuhn or Lakatos, but you had important messages about the data in context, not blind data processing, as data is invariably never enough for fully data-driven outcomes. Now, there is an increased debate in scientific communities about issues related to bias and wow. ethics in data science. Quite often, there is talk about eliminating bias as a, mis a means towards more ethical outcomes. But pretty much as one cannot eliminate bias in human thinking, wouldn't be appropriate to refocus part of that debate in data science, not in the direction of eliminating bias, but in the direction of managing bias, in some cases, even strengthening bias in order to deliver outcomes more consistent with our aims, especially in domain specific context, but also more consistent with human values. So I will finish the question with this. So recognize bias and work on bias management instead of bias elimination 
and wouldn't be the contribution of science valuable in that direction, especially if we currently cannot contemplate accepting AI decisions, but we are ready to accept human decisions, even if human decisions are ill-informed, whereas data science ones can be better informed. So that's, uh, that's the question that's, and the debate. That, that is a fabulous question, and it, and it will be one of the most important areas of data science research. So let's say I want to analyze American society relative to prejudice against Blacks. The data will reflect reality. And if I analyze that data and report it, it may violate American laws because it's biased against Blacks because they go to jail more. They, get, they, they, they are economically depressed. They don't have as much success in business. So our society is, in, is biased in many, many ways for which I, I feel shame myself. So bias is inherent in our social system. And if I might appeal to Yanis's first question, I believe that his view was biased based on his depth of understanding of science, which is probably very deep. And the difficulty of overcoming that bias to see something different. So bias is an inherent part of human life and you need to recognize it if you want to solve the real problem and if you want to minimize it. So the minimization of bias is sort of a, a silly political uh, a point of view that avoids the inherent issue of, of what is the cause of bias and can it be eliminated at all? Is that, does that answer your question? It goes a long way towards that, but I was wondering if, um fusing input from science is one way of um, helping us to manage uh, bias in different ways and direct AI outcomes towards more desirable um, end results, including consistent with human values. So Christos, um, I did, <clears throat> did, did, my, did my answer respond to your concern? It, it did, and uh, thank you very much for that. I was just wondering if um, it is uh, legitimate to target in data science to managing bias rather than eliminating it. Absolutely. So first of all, you got to define it. And once you've defined it, you need to be able to detect it during, I don't know, during data. Now. So there's many phases in which you could look at bias, both at the input which I think is the most important part, but you could also analyze it as the result. And maybe even during the analyst, ah, yeah. I, I good, it's a good area of research for research. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, so uh, I, I think, don't see any other hands. Yeah. So I think at this point we can, uh, we can finish the formal part. And thank Michael again for his uh, very interesting and provocative, what she said, talk. And hope to see you here again. <laughs>